This is just a reminder that this, these presentations are for just training purposes only. We will be talking about the pre-acquisition process along with the appraisal process and the importance of it. There are three ways that we acquire right away from a valuation standpoint, and that is by using a cost estimate, a data book, or an appraisal. And we're gonna talk about these three items in details. And I just wanna mention that there are certain requirements that must be met in order to use each one. The first one is the cost estimate. And there are certain requirements that has to be met in order for the cost estimate to be used. And the first one is no consequential damages are, are anticipated. And if you have to ask the question whether or not there are damages, then it is my recommendation that you do not use the cost estimate. If there, there has to be no question in your mind when you use it concerning damages. Number two, the value has to be $15,000 or less in order to use it. And also the values for the cost estimates are approved for 60 days and they have to be approved by the reviewer. And they should be given to the reviewer right before you are ready to start your acquisition because once the reviewer approves it, your clock is ticking. So you have to make sure that you get it to the reviewer right before you're ready to go so you so that you won't cut into your 60 day wonder and also with the cost estimate there is no range of value you have to make the offer that is made must be what is listed on the cost estimate for that parcel so if that parcel has a a value of 500 dollars that's what the offer sh should be because there is no range of value when it comes to the cost estimate. Now the data book is a little different and the data book is the same uh, process as the uh, cost estimate. Number one, no consequence of damages are anticipated. If you have to ask the question and say, I wonder if there's any damages on this property. If you have to ask that question, then you cannot use the data book. Also, the value is has to be less than $25,000 in order to use it. And the data book has a range of values, which simply means that between those, those ranges, we have to come up with a valuation in order to offer to the property owner. And those values are also approved for 60 days. And I just want to highlight that this, this method is seldom used today, but it is a tool that we have if we need to use it. And then when to use the appraisal. The appraisal is used when consequential damages are anticipated. When you have a value that's you think is going to be more than $25,000. And always remember that the property owner can always elect to have an appraisal prepared. So once you go out and you make an offer to a property owner using the cost estimate or the data book, you have to get a waiver uh, to get the property owner's permission to use those procedures in order to acquire the right of way. If the property owner does not agree with it, then an appraisal has to be prepared. There are some things that are, that are non-compensable items. We won't spend much time um, discussing these things. So whoever you're working with um, concerning a project, you might want to discuss with them some of the things that are non-compensable. I would talk about just a couple just like driveway easements and fencing easements are not considered comp uh, compensable items because they are 
gratuities, they are providing a service to the owners. So therefore they are non compensable. So you'll see when you get uh, appraisal sometime where they're not paying for or uh, compensating for certain items and certain easements. And that is why, because they are non compensable items. Also just want to discuss donations for a minute. Even though you are getting a donation or somebody might want to donate, you still have to get an appraisal on that property or prepare a cost estimate on that property. And, all this, and an offer has to be made before you can solicit a donation. And also donations must be unsolicited. The next step we will discuss is the five step process. And this is a, a way to appraise property for eminent domain. And this came from the Gunnels versus D, the Department of Transportation case, where the courts told us how we should go about appraising for eminent domain. And the five steps are simply this. First, you will determine the fair market value of the entire tract of the property before any part is taken. Second, the value of the partial portion taken consider as a part of the whole tract. Number three, the value of the remaining tract, but just before the taking, the value of the remaining as a part of the whole by subtracting the value of the part taken from the value of the entire property. Four, the market value of the remainder just after the taking, considering the negative impact of the separation of the part from the whole. And finally, the fifth step, the positive impact of the taking of the part upon the value of the remainder just after the taking. Obviously, steps four and five are dealing with consequential damages and must be determined separately from steps one, two, and three. In as much as the actual value is determined separately from the consequential damages, which may be added to but cannot be deducted from the value of the part taken. So the five step process is basically is you value the property in its before state which means you value the entire property. The second step, you value the part that, that we are acquiring. The third step is you value the before, the remainder in the before. Then the fourth step, you appraise the remainder in the after. And there's any differences in the, in the value of the remainder before and the remainder after, then that or consequential damages. So that's the five step process. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the larger parcel and also another portion of the five step process. The value of the partial po portion taken consider as a part of the whole track. And that's simply saying if the acquisition is coming off a 100 acre track, then the properties that are used to the develop the valuation has to also be 100 acre tracks. If it's coming off a 10 acre track, then the comparables you would use would be 10, from a 10 acre track and so on. If you are being acquired from a one acre track, then you will compare it to other one acre track because the value of the partial portion taken is considered as a part of the whole track. And we have two types of reports. <clears throat> the first one is a 388C and it's a summary report and it's a strip take. And it basically works the same way as the cost estimate as far as using it. It cannot be used if there is a possibility of consequential damages. It is not to be used if it's a possibility of damages. 
And it has to be a simple, a simple, very simple acquisition. And if it's a question of whether or not there may be some damages or a question of, of the complexity of the pro property or anything such as that, then the 388C summary report cannot be used. It is for very simple acquisitions. The 388 in before and after, which is a narrative report, it goes through all the five steps that we were just talking about. And it considers whether or not the property is suffered any kind of negative impact from the acquisition. Therefore, it goes into the before and the after of the property, which means it looks at the the remainder before, it looks at the remainder after, and to see if that property can still operate like it did in the before. And if there's some differences in it, that's how the consequential damages come into play. 532 is the review, review appraisals report. That is a very important document because what the 532 does, it determines what is the fair market value. And whatever the 532 states as the value is the official fair market value. And that is the value that you use to make an offer. If the review appraisal report says that the property has a value of $1,000, then when you get ready to make the offer. You can't make an offer of $1,200. You can't make an offer of $900. You have to make the offer that is shown on the 532, which is the review appraisal's report. And sometimes it might be, um, is rare, but you might see in some cases where the appraisal report will have one value and the reviewer's report will have another value. Well, the report that you use is not the appraiser's report, but the reviewer's report. The reviewer is the one that it, who established the value. So you make sure that you use whatever number that's on the review appraiser's report because it is the official fair market. And we're just talking about bundles of rights for just a second. And this is very important. When you hear the word right away, that is the same thing as fee simple. And what fee simple is, is that we are acquiring all the rights to that property and we wanna own it in absolute ownership, which means fee simple. And we also acquire some properties with an easement. And we have two types of easements, basically. And we have a permanent easement and we have a temporary easement. A permanent easement means that we want to keep it into perpetuity, which means the, the easement just continues on. And then temporary easement when they are acquired is that they'll last for a while and then they will expire upon completion of the project or for a, a length of time, which could be one year, it could be five years or however many years that is that are established. Um, the purposes of easement, easements are very important um, because what easements can allow us to do is that in places where there, where you have to have green space, you have to have a certain area for parking, uh, different things that the property owner needs to meet setback rules because the easement allows us to go into uh, to work, but not to take ownership. And the property owner still owns the property and it allows them to continue to still meet those setback rules or any kind of rules that are going on there 
to allow them to still use their property in some fashion. And temporary easements allow us to be able to work in a certain area for a certain period of time. And once the expiration of the easements has come, then they just automatically revert back to the owner. 